the Holy Spirit gives us a whole new outlook, a whole new way of dealing with ourself and dealing with life. It's a whole different vantage point in being able to serve God. And so everything has now changed because before it was about outside commands and about pressure put on and about how you were supposed to behave. And now he says, I'm going to work from the inside. And so the spirit is not an outside force that makes us behave. The spirit is something that is put within us to give us the inside understanding of God, motivation to follow God, love of God. All of these things give us such an advantage that when we would choose to follow God, it's not just a matter of somebody else putting pressure but the fact that we are really able to become who God wants us to be. Galatians 5.16 But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit... You are not under the law. And so Paul tells them if they walk by the Spirit, or if they do the things of the Spirit, if they allow Spirit into their life, that they will not do the things that they physically want, the things of the flesh. And so he's drawing a contrast here between things that are spiritual and things that are physical, things of the flesh is the way he describes it. Those are two different natures, and we find ourselves in conflict between them. The things we want physically are are things that make us feel good. But the things that God wants are things that will make us feel good. And that may sound like the same, but the physical things are just things that make us feel good physically. And the spiritual things are things that make us feel good everywhere. And so it's not just in our spirit. It's all the way down in our soul that we feel good. And so he's drawing this contrast because there is this conflict between these two things. And he says these are like two different natures at war within the same person. And so we can make a choice as to which one to follow. And the Spirit helps with that choice. And those who are led by the Spirit will follow the things of the Spirit. And those who choose the things that are physical won't do the things of the Spirit. And so as he describes this, it's a matter of this contrast of conflict between these two different things that's going on in the same person. Uh, It can be real difficult. How do you avoid a temptation? The two things he's describing here are both things that we would do. And so one is a physical thing we would do. The other is a spiritual thing we would do. Make sure we understand that both of those are things that a person would do and not just the absence of another. It's not like, well, we're either going to do something physically that's wrong or we're going to abstain. Abstaining is not spiritual. I mean, it's a good start toward not having things to overcome, but it is not the positive side of doing things that are spiritual. And so it's important for us to understand these two. So let's maybe an illustration. Say we love ice cream. We just like to eat ice cream every single night right before we bed. Great big bowl of ice cream. Ice cream is wonderful. It tastes good. We like ice cream of all different flavors. We like chocolate. We like vanilla. We like strawberry. And we can go through all 31 flavors and say, I like every single one of them. And I want a scoop of every single one of them every single night. What a great goal to have. Isn't that wonderful? Except as the weeks go on, we may notice we are changing shape. And we are no longer the same size we used to be. Well, all we're doing is eating ice cream. It's something that we like. It's milk, a little sugar little freezing. What could be wrong? Well, it is the result we want. And we don't want the result of eating ice cream every single night. Because as we begin to get bigger and bigger, it's 
saying, well, maybe I can't eat ice cream every single night. And so we realize that that behavior of doing something that seems so good because it tastes so good is going to have a complete different who knew taste and size could be related. Uh, I mean, how did that come about? And yet we realize they are. And so take the other side, say a person wants to be strong. And so they'll go and they'll exercise and they'll, they'll run a mile or two miles or, you know, longer than that even. They'll go to the gym, they'll lift weights, they'll do all kinds of things, and then they find they change shape. Well, who knew? Why does that make you change shape? And so they get stronger because they have been doing something that produces a result in them. And so both of these we can see will change who you are, then they change the shape that you are. It's not enough to be in good shape to just quit eating ice cream. We can say, all right, I know, it's, I'll just quit eating ice cream. And the fact that we are avoiding something that may seem and taste good for us, but turns out not to be so good for us, is not an advantage. We have done nothing about the issue. It does help, but it will not change into the strong person, we have to start the exercise part of this in order to become the strong person. Neither can we lift all the weights and run extra miles and still eat all the ice cream we want and think, oh, it'll all balance out. Really? You know it's not going to balance out. He says both sides have to be dealt with. There's something you have to do in order to accomplish, in order to be stronger. There's something you have to quit in order to be stronger and not bigger. It gives us the fact that we see results that seem unrelated to an action that we have, and yet they are related. We think about our spiritual life, and we think it's not related to any activities we would do. And yes, they are related. The fact that we would pray and study our Bible and get together with Christians and worship God is a positive influence in our life that makes for a relationship with God that makes us stronger spiritually. The fact that we would avoid bars and not go around you know, bad things, bad movies, drugs, whatever it is, and say, okay, I've avoided all these things. Well, that helps for you to avoid things. It does not make you spiritual. And so I hope you can see the contrast with these. Not only do we have to avoid one, we have to do something about the other. Both of these are things we would do. And so the way he describes this difference in flesh and spirit, both are things we would do. And so maybe it'll help with this next passage. Galatians 5.19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so Paul here talks about anger, he talks about morals, he talks about relationships, and he talks about abuse. And all of these things are negative. Well, how many of those do we have to do in order to be this type of person that he describes? This is a pretty bad person, isn't it? I don't see how anybody would enjoy being around them. And as you look at all of these different things, well, what if we only did half of those? That'd make us a better person, right? Wouldn't it make us better if we only did, how about if we only did two of them? You know, just fits of anger and jealousy. We would be a pretty good person, wouldn't we? If we could only do two just fits of anger and jealousy over every person we see. Well, no. 
And we recognize that all of these kind of clump together because generally if you do one, you're going to have the other. Jealousy brings about envy, jealousy over who people are and envy over what people have. And we want what they have so that we can be who they are. And the fits of anger and dissension and all of those things that bring about problems between people, they, are, they all kind of clump together and connect. The immorality and the things like this that we would have, is they all kind of connect, don't they? To form a person of the flesh, a person who's only interested in what's physical. And the fact that we can point to the fact that, you know, we're, we're not all that angry. We're not all that moral either, but we're not all that angry. And so we must be a pretty good person. No. Because he's describing all of these things as things that lead to sin. He says, any of these things will keep you out of the kingdom of God. They will destroy your relationship with Jesus. You will not be able to have this relationship with God. You will not be able to go to heaven to be with God. Can I say it 10 more different ways? Do do you understand what I'm saying? That the person who has left themselves with this kind of personality, this kind of character, isn't going to make it. And Paul's pretty sure about that. But then there's good news. There's something that's much better that's coming because that's what the Spirit does. And if left to our own device to fight all of these urges and cravings, we might be a lost cause. But he says there's something else that is much better. And that is the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.22 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And so the fruit of the Spirit grows out of the Spirit being in our life. And it takes the person who has been angry and who has been envious of others and jealous of someone else. And it causes him to develop the characteristics of peace and of patience. It causes him to understand what love is about even in less than ideal times. He causes us to understand patience in the middle of a virus and love in the middle of a war. It doesn't matter about the conditions around us, but the Spirit is able to change us. He does not change the world. He changes us to be people of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And so all of those qualities are one single thing. It is the fruit of the Spirit, one fruit. And each one of those is a different part of the character that we make up that is called a spiritual person. You can't just skip one and say, well, I'm doing good. I have some of the fruit. I have love and joy. I got no patience at all. It doesn't work that way. He says, all of these come together because they are all interconnected the same way we will find sins interconnected. But as the Spirit works on the inside of us, He changes who we have been with His power to become something we never thought we could be. It might be like you driving down the road and realizing this is a terrible road. There's lots of ruts. There's lots of bumps. There's lots of uneven pavement. In fact, there's not even any pavement. There's lots of rocks. And we wonder what's wrong. Why doesn't somebody fix the road? Or do we get the vehicle then that is able to handle the road? See, which way do we want to do this? And we do have the option. We can either smooth out the road and make the road 
clean and smooth so that our car will always run on it. And the car may not be very good and it doesn't really work hardly at all. But at least if we make the road smooth enough, it will still roll. Or the road is just going to be what the road is. And the road's going to be bumpy and the road's going to be tough sometimes. But we have a car that's able to handle it. And it can climb over rocks and it can go over ruts and it can, you know, it can go anywhere that we need it to go. Well, what kind of life do we want? As long as things go smooth, everything will be fine. Or we do it, or do we want to be a little bit tougher and decide that, you know what, I want a life that can handle some things. I want a life that can handle a two-year-old. I want a life that can handle teenagers. I want a life that can handle a marriage because those are not going to be smooth. And yet, are they worth it? Absolutely. And every time we get into a relationship, we're going to see times where it's going to be rough. And so either we make it smooth by having no one and no disturbances around us, or we make ourselves better where we are now mature enough to handle it. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He makes it so that we are able to have love and joy and peace and patience in a marriage with a two-year-old, with teenagers, with angry bosses, with whoever is around us, because we are able to handle a whole different world. So James and John are seen as the sons of thunder. They want to call fire down from heaven who doesn't welcome them. And Jesus won't allow it. And you know what John's name is later? The beloved disciple. The one that Jesus loves. The disciple, of, well, how did that happen from going <laughs> from being a son of thunder to the beloved disciple, the one who writes more about love than anyone? It's because the Spirit began working in his life. And it's not immediate, but the Spirit is so powerful, and he whispers. He doesn't shout at you and say, stop doing that. He whispers and says, you ought to stop doing that. You're hurting yourself. You're not doing yourself any favors when you do that. You ought to look at God. You ought to follow God. And he's someone we're able to follow. He's someone who can change our heart from the inside to become what God really wants us to be. What an advantage that is to us, that we have the power of a God of creation, the power of a God of majesty to work on our heart to make us holy and acceptable to him. What a great thing it is to have the Spirit in our life.